So good afternoon all. So we will continue with the next session, session one, um, engaging with uh, users, facility users and uh, scientists and how to expand the research of communications effort. Um, as Andrea before said, we merge two sessions together now. So continue with engagement. Um, I guess some challenges how to engage are similar for the publics, as we learned, it's publics, not public anymore, <laughs> as well for the scientists. So our own experience is also that um, so many users come to get their measure time at our facilities from all over the world, and then afterwards they're gone. And then it's the problem how to engage with them, how to get the information later. And I hope like in the next three talks that we have here, um, we will get some insight and some good practice or ideas of how we can change that and improve that. Um, so welcome our speakers, um, Elise Brower, um, Adelaide Coot, George Rivero Gonzalez, he will be remotely there. And as in the sessions before, I would say we go for the questions like after all the talks. It should be easier then. Okay, then um, welcome Elise Brauer. She works at Astron in the Netherlands and is a corporation communication advisor there. So the stage yeah. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, today we'll be presenting um, uh, our proposed community building plan. Um, so it's not, uh, um, it's not the results of a, of a successful project. Uh, but it's the process that we are in at the moment. And um, yeah, I would like to, at the end, uh, hear your experiences, uh, maybe some inspiration as we are on the way, where we're going at the moment. Um, oh, uh, right, okay. So um, Astron um, operates uh, three or uh, two uh, telescopes, which are uh, WSR, uh, uh, the WSRT, uh, which is in the Netherlands. Uh, we operate them, we built them as well. Same is for LOFAR, the low frequency array. And of course we are uh, a member of, of SCA. Uh, that's why the Dutch flag is, uh, is outside. Um, well, today my talk will be about uh, LOFAR, the low frequency array. Um, and um, so um, currently still <laughs> LOFAR is the, low, the, the world's largest uh, low frequency array. And um, uh, the core, this is the core uh, that you see on screen uh, is in the Netherlands. Um, as, as Frank mentioned in his, his talk before, uh, this is in a little village uh, and where we, uh, engage with the, the local uh, community there. Um, uh, LOFAR will be uh, an IRIC soon, uh, an European Research Infrastructure Consortium, um, which will be like a, a legal difference uh, where we bring, where, where the idea is that the, the European research community uh, will be brought together. Um, so LOFAR is, um, um, the, the, the situation of LOFAR is that every member country has its own, is its own station. Uh, as you can hear, see here on the map, it is throughout Europe. Um, and uh, so with this, own, with this station all come, also comes uh, their own department. Um, and um, um, they, they can use, so, so LOFAR can be used as a, um, uh, independent system, so where all, station, all stations work independently, or as a big linked um, uh, infrastructure. Um, but um, uh, to become a user for, for LOFAR, um, uh, especially when you're from another uh, scientific discipline than astronomy, um, or a junior uh, in, in, in your studies, or a junior in programming, uh, the threshold to start using LOFAR data is really high. Um, uh, as my colleague friend mentioned, is, mentioned it sometimes, is you really have to be a data ninja. <laughs> um, and um, while this, this, this could result in, in less multidisciplinary research or the amount of users uh, that decrease, um, and therefore that the, the, the beautiful instrument that we have uh, doesn't reach its full uh, potential. So, um, 
therefore, um, uh, we identified uh, together with uh, Irene Bonatti, she's the um, uh, uh, a policy officer of Love for Eric. We identified uh, a few goals um, for the Love for Eric community. And um, so the idea is that, that, um, that it is shown that collaborations uh, between different scientific fields, uh, professional levels, cultures, um, uh, well, diversity um, it works better. Um, and um, many, but, but many people don't know um, what insights the LOFAR data can provide. And um, so, therefore, um, I'd like to stress the idea that that um, research infrastructures such as LOFAR uh, can benefit from a networked uh, or co-creating community, a research community, um, where there is a multidisciplinary, multi-level and, and, uh, and networked uh, community situation, um, so that that uh, different eyes uh, into research questions, uh, we get different different eyes on research questions, and um, well, hopefully it enhances the, the the quality of the, the work and the output. So the the questions um, we are we are having at the moment, um, I'm not going to read them out. Um, but these three, of course, we've got many more, but these are the, the three central questions. Um, and in order to to answer them, we've uh, researched for different uh, models. Uh, and I will discuss these different models in, in, the, in the next slides. Um, some of them are from, uh, from marketing, actually. Uh, it's because of my background and from, I, I used to work in the, in the commercial industry, uh, where, of course, we think uh, a lot from, from marketing perspective. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> um, the community, uh, 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 maturity model. Um, this is um, this is the way we analyzed the the maturity level of the already existing LOFA community. Um, also, together with uh, Irene Bonatti, we um, uh, um, we assessed the the current situation. Um, we, we, you can see here uh, at the, at the circles that many of them are already on the right hand side. So uh, a lot of, uh, as, well, actually three aspects are uh, in the network side um, and only three in, in the community uh, situation. Um, so here you can see that uh, the, the community management, um, well, needs, needs improvement. Um, um, let me see where I am. Yeah, so um, therefore we, um, we need to um, uh, determine uh, the, um, the resources that we have, um, th that we need to manage the community. Um, 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 and uh, we need to determine the approach to engagement and moderation of the community and uh, what roles and responsibility for, for LOFAR ERIC uh, there are and uh, possible appointed ambassadors. Um, so for example, an ambassador um, to, to make the, the community aware uh, of each other's existence uh, and what everyone needs. So um, the former model, the, the uh, maturity uh, uh, model gave an insight of, of the level of the current of the current situation. Uh, this model uh, gives us insight of, of how um, uh, how we get to a, a co-create or a network situation. This, this gives us um, tools basically. Um, and uh, here you can see the champion mode, um, and we are interested in this. Uh, this bit in particular, as we would like to take our, take ourselves as much out of uh, the community the community as possible, that we are not like in the first example in the center, and that we are conveying um, or well co contributing a, a situation we would like to be 
um, outside in a different way. Um, so um, the champion um, not only co-creates, also collaborates, contributes, uh, and convey uh, and, and consume. So it, it, the, 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 the person will be uh, uh, a community member um, as well. Um, and um, so, so the idea we, we, we could think about um, is, is um, uh, coach the champion to run trainings, for example. Uh, and that is then how low for Eric will uh, position uh, itself. Um, I'm running out of time, I see already. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, as there's already an, uh, an existing community, um, there's a LOFAR family meeting in June, uh, there was already. Um, and uh, during this meeting, uh, we've, um, of Irene, identified um, uh, uh, people uh, with whom we could have in-depth uh, interviews. Uh, to understand what they need and how they see uh, their own role in, in the community. Um, and this is uh, a couple of ideas of how we could level uh, their willingness. So um, for these interviews, we use the value proposition model. Um, uh, we use this already within our organizations for within our organization for uh, uh, project teams. And we find that it, it, it has a success because it makes you think outside in instead of inside out um, to get an idea of who is your user. Um, it's, it's stated here as a customer profile because that's, that's what use, most businesses have, uh, but I don't really see a very big difference uh, when thinking about, um, yeah, uh, uh, about stakeholders. Um, so yes, um, we use this to, to understand our, uh, um, our uh, our audience. Um, I won't read this out loud, of course. Um, but we, here's here's where we give answer to the questions. Um, we we going we will check with the person um, what is their what is their goal, uh, what what is the job they they want to get done. Um, I wrote down uh, an, an example, and um, so. Uh, if we if we if we create when we created a, a customer profile with with understanding what are their um, what are their challenges and what are their gains, um, we will uh, determine what will be gain creators and what will uh, relieve them of their of the challenges they have or the, the pains they have, um, and this will also help us define uh, a communication product or a service that we, um, how we can help the community or, or the ambassador. Uh, and that is the products and services that, is, that will tell us how we position ourselves towards the, the stakeholder. Um, so, oh yeah. Um, this is the last, um, I already mentioned, uh, this is, these are the questions that we try to answer with the models uh, I've, I've just shown. Um, and and, and um, so, uh, yeah, the reason um, for, for the, the first question gave, the re gave us the reason to use the community maturity model and the value proposition model, um, with, which will give us hopefully uh, uh, substantial insights in, in, in the members' needs. And, um, Second question is, is what shall we do next? Um, uh, uh, will we position Lofar Eric, um, uh, the, community, the communications team as, as inspiring and empowering, um, as, as mentioned also in the, in the models, um, so, that, so that we actually manage to, to move the, communication, uh, the, the community to a networked or co-create situation. Um, and, and the third one is, um, we would like to explore uh, what additional resources uh, are needed that might help the members in unexpected ways. Um, things that they didn't mention during the interviews, but that um, that they so things that they might not know now, but they would need want um, things that don't exist yet, maybe for them. Um, yeah. So, does have anyone have an experience of gone through the same process? Um, 
I would be very happy to hear that. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you, Elisa. Um, we already invite you for the next party, then maybe you can uh, show examples of interviewing the, your scientists and get away some answers then. Of your yeah, questions. yeah, then I can <laughs> present a successful project, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so for general questions, we wait after the other talks then. Okay, the next would be uh, Jorge Rivero Gonzalez. He works as a science communication officer at Jive, also based in the Netherlands. So you're actually a neighbor of Elisa, I guess. Hi everyone, can you see, can you see me? I'm... Yeah, we see you. Okay, good. Uh, um, I just need to uh, share your screen. Yeah, Do you see perfect. my screen now? Do you see my slides? Yes, now everything is perfect. You can start, Thanks. thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Jorge Rivera Gonzalez. I'm the Jive Science Communications Officer. And yeah, I'm speaking to you from, from the Netherlands where we are based. And today I, I will just uh, explain a bit what we are what we are doing, and also uh, what are the our yeah, communication actions. Uh, uh, what are some of the challenges and or and lessons learned that we have um, yeah learned uh, along the along the way. So I think uh, first I think it's it's important to to start talking about let me let me to start talking about uh, who we are. And I think, well, JIF is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium that we provide central support to the European BRBI network. We have international cooperation at the heart of our activities. Yeah, we have different seven member countries, additional support from different institutes in China, Germany, and South Africa. And yeah, as I mentioned, yeah, we give support to people using this uh, network of telescopes called the European BRBI network. And we also provide support to, and services to activities for the whole radio astronomy community. So uh, let me see. So if uh, our mission in short is to promote and implement the use of uh, BLBI, very long baseline interferometry and radio astronomy. And I think before I go any, for, any further, I, I think it's best to clarify what uh, BLBI is in case you, you don't know. This is a um, astronomy technique, radio astronomy technique where multiple telescopes uh, can focus on a single source and observe it, and observe it at, at the at same time uh, and then combine the, the observations to have a, a better, let's call it a better uh, observation. For instance, this technique was used for having these uh, uh, famous images of the shadow of the black holes in, in, in uh, recent years, with not with our network, but with, uh, with another net network. But just if, to, to give you an example of what BLBI is. Uh, I mentioned this uh, European BLBI network. Uh, it's a network of telescopes located uh, in, in, in yeah, mainly in Europe, as you can see in the image, but also we have uh, many telescopes in Asia and, some, and one in South Africa. And then, well, we had the Arecibo telescope in, in Puerto Rico that was part of this network. Uh, these telescopes uh, cover, uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, we have a wide coverage worldwide. And all these telescopes are uh, well operated by these uh, different uh, organizations that are EVN uh, members. Some of them are full members, other, others are associated members. But I, I, I show you this because they are also involved uh, in our uh, communication actions. And just to finish this uh, introduction about uh, what we do, I won't read all, all that is here, but uh, we have this correlator that is this, uh, let's call it machine that combines all the all the data and makes the processing to, to make these uh, improved observations. And then we provide a support to the users of this uh, network from the proposal preparation when they have, uh, and then until they, they, were, they are analyzing their data. And also we also help them communicate the, the, the results. Uh, and yeah, and our staff, it's, uh, we have scientists, engineers, they, they do many things uh, for their capabilities of BLBI, also in their free free time, uh, they do uh, some of them do some research in, in, in astronomy. But then let's talk about the um, uh, our communication activities. So I uh, well I started working uh, like the past in the, in 2021, and then we uh, developed I think for well first for the first time a communication strategy uh, for the for Jive and for the European B, uh, BLBI network. Uh, that will cover the next uh, two years, 2022, 2023. Uh, well, a little disclaimer. So this is a work in progress. So we'll start implementing 
implementing it. So today I, I present more a bit of, of what we are, are already have already done, but also what we want to do, and also the challenges uh, encountered so far, but and also some lesson learned. So building this was done uh, building from a previous work that was done during the H2020 Jumping Jive project. That was a, a project uh, that, that happened in the past five years that was very important uh, for Jive because. Uh, set foundations for the organization or uh, in, in different areas. And then the, it, it was when it was possible to hire a, a communication officer and I start doing more systematic uh, actions and uh, creating many resources, also uh, building up websites. And, and, and these, let's say, have uh, crystallized or, or with, and help out uh, make this uh, communication strategy. This is co-created uh, with input from the outreach officers uh, from all these EVM partners that are part of this uh, EVM outreach officers network. And also it has feedback from the users of the EVM regarding type of activities they would like to, to have. Uh, some of the, the goals of this communication strategy, not all of them, I just included here a, a couple, uh, is to uh, expand visibility of, of our organization uh, among uh, astronomers, among peers, to attract uh, new users or trying to uh, also not reach out also to the people that like that right astronomers but also trying to see how can we involve new people just do just new astronomers in other fields and also how to increase the awareness to 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 the for the organization but also to build the eye to the general to the general public uh, by organizing activities public engagement activities and also engage with other uh, communication effort efforts that are happening uh, around the world and with different organizations like the International Astronomical Union. Our target audiences are uh, astronomers, policymakers, and then uh, I included here to make it uh, like easier to, to explain general public as everything that it's not uh, uh, astronomers or, or policymakers. Uh, we use multi-channel strategy in terms of uh, we rely a lot on, on online uh, activities, but also trying to see if we can do a different type of activities, uh, yeah, in-person activities and other type of activities. And we try to uh, always think how can this be uh, maximized? How can we maximize our reach through through this network, through these uh, uh, other institutions that are part of the European BLBI network? So in principle, let's say our basic service to the community and let's say that was was done like before in a way and, and we keep doing that as a day to day is to to serve as a hub for the our the science results from that are done with the telescope from the networks so whenever there is like an interesting result uh, yeah the pis get together uh, through their through their maybe their institutes uh, we uh, engage to to see how can we organize a, a joint press release how can we distribute it through and then distributed through the through the localized uh, uh, communities that everyone has in their countries. Uh, and the other basic basic service that we had is a newsletter. We publish this uh, three times per year, and then we we use it uh, to promote our call for proposals that it comes uh, once per every every four months, and it's published one uh, month before the before the proposal uh, the call for pro proposal deadline, and it serves to compile that, uh, news, uh, scientific results. The news from networks, updates, events, etc. And 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 but uh, we also have uh, specific activities for these different communities because, as I mentioned, uh, our goals, let's say, our main goal is to give give a service to our users. Uh, so we need to think about how to engage with them and how to especially attract new new ones. Uh, well, and here are some examples of 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 of, of activities. There are more, but here are. A few, uh, I guess, as, as many of the um, organizations uh, that during the pandemic uh, they started this type of of uh, seminars, online seminars uh, uh, that we uh, use to engage uh, scientists, engage uh, astronomers, and show synergies uh, that between different areas. So, so we can foster collaboration. We can attract new new people that can use later the the our uh, uh, network of, of telescope. We have done two seasons, let's call it like that, uh, leading up to uh, uh, our main symposium, which is the EVN uh, symposium that is celebrated uh, every summer. Uh, and the last one was in last, last week in, in Ireland. And usually this, this, uh, it's, uh, every of, it's, these seminars are attended by 100 uh, 
uh, people online, but it's it's good that this legacy uh, it's it's then hosted. These legacy videos are hosted then on our YouTube channel, and then people can go uh, back later to to watch them. For instance, we have like thousands of of, of views for for these activities. And then another interesting activity is that we started not long ago, and this came from from suggestion from our, our user. It was to have like an online training uh, right before our um, uh, deadline for the call for proposal, not just to it, just to engage. Let's let's say on one hand to engage new users and our support astronomers had conversation with people on proposal preparation and schedule preparation. So this served a bit more about reaching out to, to people and, and establish this connection because it's it's always much better establish this uh, connection, personal connection, even if, even if it's online, than just to have this conversation by, by email. And also help, we see that, that uh, people that already were users came came to to these uh, events to know how, how to refresh their, their knowledge uh, well it's important for us to reach outside uh, radio astronomy bubble and engage all kind of uh, astronomers so that's so we try for this it's important to go where people are and not just expect that people come to you so we were in, in part of the international conference uh, not that long ago we went into the this european astronomical society uh, conference in valencia we were talking with a lot of people about blbi about the red astronomy about what we were doing a lot of astronomers that didn't know us uh, and then uh, we also try to engage in social media, having campaigns, trying to fight with, it's, 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 it's more difficult trying to build up when we are not that big and trying to build up our, our community, trying to also to fight the algorithm. So it's, it's, it's something that we also do. We have uh, activities for general public, let's, let's call it like that. Like, as I said, not, not astronomers or not policymakers. Well, we participate in uh, outreach uh, give, give talks, our, our staff give talks uh, to different audiences. We also organize these open days with Astron, as uh, Frank mentioned in the, in the previous uh, session, because we, they are our host institution. We write articles in magazines, and, uh, and also we have made, uh, this is an example of an activity we made recently. It's a, a school activity, it's a pilot activity where we invited a, a class to come and to, to make the hands-on activities on interferometry. You can see here uh, the, the kids, the children, uh, distributing magnets in a whiteboard uh, to simulate the configuration of base, baselines of telescopes doing interferometry. And with just a laptop and a camera and a, like a free software that can reconstruct the, this, uh, as they place the magnets in different direction, they can re reconstruct an image and try to understand how a BLBI work. So this is a type of activity that it's engaging and so and it helps to to talk about this complex issue that it's a BLBI and hopefully we can try to do these activities with other schools or try to expand these activities in the in the network or maybe so this is this is quite exciting. And then the activities for uh, police uh, for policymakers will we participate in seminars as part of the of the ERIC forum uh, where we comprise the different ERICs. And also as our director is, is the, the Eric Forum chair, he also participates uh, in, uh, from time to time in different uh, high profile events. And um, just to finish this in my last like three or four, four minutes that I, that I have, uh, I would like to discuss about several challenges we, we encounter. We, it's, it's very difficult for us uh, to reach out to astronomers outside, outside our bubble, outside the Australian astronomy bubble. Uh, BLBI, it's, 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 uh, we have this extra layer of, of complexity because interferometry is not the easiest or more appealing topic. And also, yeah, in radio astronomy, we usually, we usually don't have images as beautiful as other fields, like for instance, these images uh, from web that, have, that were released last week that engage people right away. Well, I say usually because there are these uh, images of the shadow of the black hole that are uh, impressive, of course. And well, and then we are a, a small feast between bigger ones because we it's difficult to find our place between between different uh, bigger, uh, more established organizations or collaboration with larger, larger impact like EHT. But anyway, whenever, whenever there are challenges, we have opportunities, so we can try to overcome this and try to, as I say, trying to go where where people are, trying to go to maybe talking early career forums or maybe try to explore how to use advertisement in social media, how to reach out to different people. 
to talk about BLBI, we want to explore, uh, yeah, how to make uh, more engagement content, infographics, storytelling. Uh, we are small, but then we can also try to spend time trying to find our niche market because maybe we can uh, specialize in talking more about BLBI uh, to try to reach out this general public. And I guess our better asset is trying to use the outreach offices network because we can uh, really reach out to people in the in the different countries and, uh, and localize uh, our all the outputs come that and resources that come from our communities. So just to, to finish, um, here are some uh, lesson learned, let's say not from the only from this work, but also from my experience working with international, with large networks, we're doing activities, implementing activities in, 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 in countries around the world. And I guess, um, yeah, it doesn't matter how ambitious uh, your goals are, the, it's impossible to reach them unless you have uh, good foundations. And that means that, uh, that uh, for instance, this is, let's say, where we are, because uh, uh, we are improving things like uh, our visual identity, our websites, preparing resources that our partners uh, could use to, to even uh, talk about the basic uh, basic things. So this is a bit where we, where we are, and that's really important for, for any of these uh, type of projects. And for, for an, working with a network, it's quite challenging and time consuming, uh, let's say, for a for the central coordination, but also for people involved. And I guess it, it's, it's always very important to understand their needs, uh, the level of, of engagement, because for us, for instance, we have uh, notes that they have dedicated teams, they have uh, more people than, than we have centrally, that it's only me. But then we have other, other notes that it's only one person, that it's an astronomer, that they have to do also the, the public engagement. But so it's important to not overload them, to uh, think about uh, about what could be a, a common goal, and uh, for experience, it, what always works is uh, organizing or having a, a goal of a public engagement activity to slowly build up the engagement, slowly building up uh, the belonging of this uh, community. And I guess it, it always also for me, at least for me, that I came from outside trade astronomy, it takes time to understand a community. And I guess for that, it's always important to listen, to get them involved, and, yeah, and also to reach out to other people that maybe have more experience than you, engage with other people and organizations doing similar things. And I learned a lot uh, in, the, in this conference. And I guess uh, we are open to, to discuss and, and also to contact with uh, more people. So thank you very much. And here are my email. Also, you can reach me on Twitter, but um, uh, this is our website so where you can find more information about us. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Um, so last but not least um, is Adelie, Adelie uh, Kut, Marketing Communications Manager. She works for the Australian Research Data Commons, uh, which is based in Brisbane, Queensland. Um, she made all the way to us. So happy to have you here in person. The stage is yours. Thank you. Hey, hi everyone. I'm Adele Coote and I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for the Australian Research Data Commons. Oh, it's a bit slow. Okay. Known as the ARDC for short, we drive the development of national digital research infrastructure that provides Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. We do this by accelerating research and innovation, by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high quality data assets. Just a little bit about us. We have 20 members, including universities and the CSIRO. ARDC staff are hosted at universities across Australia providing national coverage to support the work we do. The ARDC is part of a strong network of 23 national research infrastructure organizations, all brought together uh, by the Australian government under the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. These infrastructure providers cover a wide range of research disciplines from data and digital skills to astronomy 
and from climate change to nuclear science. Some of which have attendees at this conference online, like Access NRI, ANSTO, and Pawsey Supercomputing Center, although not right now as it's 1 a.m. on Australia's East Coast, right now. So the ARDC is on a journey to reach, connect, and engage with Australia's researchers about how to access our services and to accelerate their research. Our offering for researchers is a collection of intangible infrastructure services, such as a federated cloud service, digital research platforms, national data collections, and persistent identifier services, and advice on best practice data management. All of which make our projects difficult to explain, our outputs difficult to visualize, and our value difficult to promote in a crowded environment. Our offering has traditionally been tailored to support the institutions, to deliver services to researchers. Yet most researchers don't know about us and would never come to us to learn and find tools to accelerate the research. This is because we have historically worked with institutions to deliver those services. This approach has worked to an extent, but now our services are scaling up and we need more researchers to know about them and to use them. So we're ramping up our communications and reaching out to the researchers directly. The ARDC has ambitious goals to improve Australian society through the translation of research data. And we have a national vision to scale up our services and we need the researchers and their institutions to be on side to do this. Research data is a first class research output. It is expensive to collect. And once it has been used for the purpose for which it was collected, there is the potential for it to be reused again. To make this happen, we need the researcher to understand, plan and set up their data in a way that makes it findable, accessible, interoperable with other data and reusable for others in the future. We need to speak the same language as the researchers when we're talking about research data management. We need to consider what messaging will resonate with any researcher, no matter what field of research they work in or what level of career they're in. The message needs to be accurate, simple and clear so that it cuts through and drives researchers to take action. Many of you will be familiar with the use of personas and user journeys to guide your marketing communications efforts, particularly when building websites and digital products. Researchers, like all target audience, aren't a homogenous group. So we started looking at researcher segments, including the career level, high degree research students through to senior career or lead researchers. We also looked at their fields of research, as well as a simpler STEM versus humanity, humanities approach. Organization employment simplified to academic, government or industry researcher and their level of awareness and understanding of research data management, data science and software encoding. We conducted focus group interviews with a small number of academic researchers who span different career stages and disciplines. Some of them knew the ARDC, many of them did not. Based on these interviews, we developed three personas to help us develop our new website. You can see them on the screen here. They are early career researcher in STEM, early career researcher in humanities, and our mid-career researcher. And this is what we found from our research and focus interviews. I know a lot of the work we do here at the conference is around STEM, but I thought we'd focus on early career researcher, humanities researcher, Rania. So around influence and trust. She values personal connections and recommendations. She trusts the direction of her research project lead, her institution and the research office. Around her career, she's motivated to progress her career, whether through fun, uh, funding grant support, delivery of research projects, upskilling to support those projects or recognition through publications. Around communication, she's looking for clear succinct language about data and images of humanities rather than STEM on our website. She mostly uses Twitter and reads emails from her institution and data specific. She's looking for information about open data and how to apply it, clean data sets, digital tools and storage, and wants to know our offering, how our offering fits amongst others in the research data ecosystem. So I'm gonna take you through some examples of how we applied these insights. So we will be changing our website so that we're prepared to scale up our communications to more researchers. Taking on board the user feedback, the refreshed website will have a section just for researchers, which is clear, succinct and following and providing access to available services and outlining the benefits and how to access them. There will be improved SEO and navigation. The website will feature images showing different types of researchers. 
We will highlight topics including data sets, tools, services and training, as well as topics such as sensitive data. We will showcase testimonials and stories from lead researchers who are using our services, which we're looking to launch this website later this year. In the meantime, we have updated the content on our current website for our most popular research service, the Cloud Compute Service, to support our marketing efforts and have seen a big increase in the number of visitors to that page already. While we're waiting for the new, research, new website to launch, we're needing, we needed to promote what services are available right now for researchers to use. So we collated the available services and developed a simple flyer that provided a clear call to action for each service on our current website. It's a useful tool for our staff to understand what services are available. This is our base offering for all researchers, but it could be tailored in the future to meet the needs of specific segments. This has only just been developed and we only have a small amount of feedback from researchers at, at local events. Case studies showcase the researchers who use our service and create impact of the work that they do. It's very time consuming for our team to find the researchers who use our services because they don't need to register to use many of them. They're extremely valuable for engaging with researchers and partners when we can find them and can be used across all communication channels. In this way, we bring our story to life and help other researchers to understand how our services can be used. We've incorporated the research needs into all of our own channel strategies, including Twitter, LinkedIn, email newsletter, and YouTube. We have focused the most on Twitter, which we identified as a channel most used by this audience. We've created bespoke content for researchers around our services over the past 12 months, and it's paying off the most on our Twitter channel where we have made a concerted effort to increase our followers and engagement. Over the past 12 months, we've increased followers by over 2,000, bringing the total up to 6,800. And although the audience insights have been removed from Twitter, a review of our followers shows that many of them are researchers, data scientists, lecturers, and professors. We also have a number of researchers subscribing to our fortnightly email newsletter and LinkedIn accounts, but they are still predominantly stakeholder audiences. We also encourage others to share and adopt our, adapt our content through their partner email newsletters, blogs, social media channels, and to help us reach new audiences. Each month we develop original content for our blog and provide the most relevant to a number of partner newsletters. Last year we, we published almost 90 original articles which were shared via our own channels. And over that same time, the ARDC content featured a number of external articles, blogs, email newsletters, websites, uh, media releases and podcasts. We plan to use this approach to identify researchers specific channels to influence them directly. So that was the past 12 months. What are our next challenges on the horizon? Well, reaching out directly to researchers is a new way of working for our stakeholders and staff. So we need to do some work to bring them along on our journey. Our staff holding the, uh, hold the key to our partner and stakeholder relationships. So we plan to run some communications training for them and provide them with key messages and guidance for communicating to their stakeholders. We plan to work with our members and partners to de develop co-develop co collateral uh, messaging and events which promote ARDC services alongside their existing institutional services. And over the, and the, over the next 12 months, we have a number of new national digital research tools and services coming online for researchers to access and use. This includes 26 digital research platforms, 26 national assets, a virtual desktop service and large memory servers and GPU reservations. For Rania, our early career researcher, humanities researcher, will need to work through which of these services and tools are the most relevant for her and focus on them when promoting to the, her group. The ARDC is also transitioning to a new way of working and will be developing in partnership thematic research data commons in three key themes of health, environment and humanities and indigenous data. We will continue to deliver all the same digital research services for researchers and will continue to be available for use by all researchers. However, we will focus our communications effort on reaching the research communities in these three areas to ensure the communities are aware and engaged to participate in the development of an integrated approach to research data management across the area. So in summary, this is what we've learned from our journey to reach the researchers over the past 12 months, which you could apply to any new audience, really. Learn as much as you can about the audience, 
Find out the needs and wants and tie that to, your to what your organization provides. Find out who the influencers are and see if they can tap into them. Find out what communication media channels your audience uses and focus on them. Test your messaging to see what resonates best and gather feedback directly from users, monitoring their engagement behaviors as you go. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Adele. So I guess we can come to the questionnaire. So Adele, um, Jorge and Elisa, are you ready to answer all the questions? <laughs> So Do we have questions in the room? Harry, please. Um, thank you, all of you. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, I, I bear in mind what I call the plumber and carpenter problem, um, where you provide user facilities, right? So it's equivalent of when your tap it leaks, you want to hire a plumber, um, but you're not hiring the user of a wrench but they can't do the job without the wrench. And in the scientific world, we provide that wrench, right? Whether it's a VLVI or whether it's a low fire array or whether it's a synchrotron or whatever. Um, how do you promote the wrench and the hammer for the carpenter when the people who fund the plumber and the carpenter, the governments and the research universities, et cetera, they don't care about the wrench and the plumber because what they don't see the output, they see the output as, a fixed tap, they don't care what the tool is, right? So what I heard from all three of you is a similar concern about how you reach out to users to a increase the user base, but also underpinning that is how do you get the users to then publicly acknowledge the value of what you provide them, right? And I thought that final one that was really interesting. What, what do they need? But in the end, they're not an ARDC user, they're a researcher at the University of Wollongong, or they're not an Astron user, or you know, not a not a LoFi user. They're a researcher at the University of Manchester. It's a challenge, and I'm I do wonder maybe we're looking at this in a slightly different way or wrong way. That may, maybe we should be saying instead, this isn't really science communication. To a degree, to me, it's often corporate communication. Are we trying to promote the institution? In which case, maybe this isn't the right way of doing it or should we just bite the bullet and say regardless of whether you're a telescope or a neutron facility you should actually just be saying actually you know what i know what my job is it's to actually communicate with the users and get them to acknowledge that they use us i don't know have you ever thought about that approach does that resonate with you i mean it, i thought all three of you were really interesting in your approach i mean i really like the community engagement model how in effect what you're trying to do or what we're trying to do as providers of use of, of facilities is how do you actually get them to acknowledge that they are a community? Yeah, everybody who uses LOFA or everybody who uses any one of those arrays is a community, but they don't see themselves as such. Or do they? <laughs> um, yeah. Um... I don't have, don't really have a clear answer. I, I do have to think about this. I, I, I do find it a very, very good statement, a very good point. Um, on the last bit of your question, uh, whether they see themselves as a, as a, a community, um, when, when taking a look at the LOFAR family, for example, uh, they organize it, it's, 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 they organize it by themselves. Uh, so they, they have, um, What's, what's the word they 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 like to to, to come together uh, and in that sense acknowledge the existence of, of of them as being a community does that answer a bit of your question yeah I, I yeah know. yeah that's that's self organizing yeah yeah it's it's, it's the lofar family meeting is um is, is a meeting of of um very active users of all levels, professors, uh, PhD students, um, and they physically come together, uh, think about the future of LOFA, what they would need from the, from, from the, um, uh, the instrument. Yeah. Jorge, you want to add something? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, maybe I can add that, I guess uh, we have to, let's say, promote our organization in terms of uh, having more users and, because we have to pay the bills and also we have to justify that all this uh, to the um, to the funders. But I, I think it's mo most important to to focus uh, 
let's say on the science, but also focus on the on having a more inclusive uh, user base in a in a way to because this at the end will uh, eventually will make the 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 science. Uh, uh, better, there will be be um, better collaborations. Uh, so I think that that, in my opinion, would be the it's uh, more the the way to look at it and to focus rather than also just uh, looking at the at the organization and uh, raise awareness about the organization. That's why I was also saying that yeah, maybe it's it's uh, at least for us that we're small uh, that maybe we can focus on a bit more uh, less brand and more about the the science topics. Um, I suppose we like to look at it, or what I think I'm going to look at it as, is that um, the researchers who use our facilities are part of a membership um, and they get value from being part of that membership. So using our services or tools um, could be something where they access something where they can't access anywhere else. So it's quite unique. Um, or it might be that they might participate in a community where they're able to accelerate their research because they're able to share those learnings with people who are just like them or might be in their field or might have access to something unique that could be applied to their field of research. And I suppose the other thing is that we think about is around at attribution and acknowledgement um, of the use of our services. Um, so all of the NCRIS facilities have a, an attribution and acknowledgement request for people that use our services. Um, and I suppose in the same way that they would acknowledge publications that they've reviewed, um, we also want them to acknowledge the research infrastructure that they've used and the people, the services and things that they've used in order to get to that research. And on another path, we're also trying to get, you know, recognition for the data sets, um, the software and the software that they've used to find that research. So it's a bit of a massive job for us, which is at the beginning. I would have another question in addition. Um, for example, maybe you have also like users from industry. I don't know if you have or not. Because I found that always like challenging, like how can you reach out users from industry? Because they are not like, uh, you can't get them in the university, maybe at conferences, but then how to tell them or how to actually um, get the interest of them, what they can actually do at your facility. Because uh, yeah, we say, for example, at the neutron facilities, they can use your neutrons to measure like non-destructive uh, materials. Um, but yeah, what, for example, for a car industry, like engines or whatever. So it's really difficult I found like for this other specific audience let's say um, we haven't started working directly with industry yet but we're starting to move into that field and so we're looking at an event I suppose to start with where we're bringing together industry and researchers to talk about First of all, each group talks about which issues and barriers they're facing and then to bring them together to talk about what solutions there might be. Um, and I suppose there's a place for us around the connection between, you know, industry and researchers. And, and I suppose as a national, you know, national research infrastructure organisation, um, we could do that at an individual level. Uh, we could do it as group levels. So if there's structures that are data or there might be health or environment, they could do it at that level. They could also do it at a national level across everything. So, um, we're just starting that journey, so sure. Any more questions? Do we have questions in the lecture? No. no? Not so far. No, so not in the... Terry, go. Um, so the the point about pushing the the benefits of enhanced collaboration in terms of better science. I mean, I see that across all of these fields. I mean, I think in large, in, the, in large physics infrastructures, because of the cost and the complexity, it's a little bit easier. Um, I wonder, I, I remember with the Trilbolton Array, you know, some of the PhD students who did their PhDs on the Trilbolton Array, quite proudly said, actually, what they spent most of their time with the PhD was bending bits of coat hanger and making the array, but they learned how it worked and they became a, commu or a community. But then they moved on and then they're just getting data from somewhere. They don't see it. It's, it's not necessarily valued. And I do wonder whether that's uh, 
that, you know, to go back to the plumber and carpenter analogy, you get you don't get promoted as a multidisciplinary research scientist still. You get promoted as a good chemist or astronomer or engineer. Right? So how do we how do we change that? And I think that point about that's really useful just as a reminder, you know, if you collaborate more, you do better science. Yep. And if you collaborate across instruments and across disciplines, you do better science, uh, which is your point. I mean, you're collaborating right across those fields, but I just, it, it's, a, it's like in the back of my mind, this sort of constant you know, user facilities. And you look at in an MX beam line on, on a synchrotron, they're, many of them are largely well, they're totally automated. You send something off, you get something back and you don't see anything, it's like magic, you know? How, how do you value that? I don't know. I mean, how do we get them to value it? Or should we even try? I'm sometimes I'm not even sure that that's worth the effort. Maybe it just is. So, but again, that, that you know, never forget, that's a really useful reminder from all of you, I think. Never forget the, the, the benefits of collaboration in terms of the quality of the science. And I think, yeah, that's, we should just remind that to bear, you know, and keep pushing people just to point that, fact that as a European institution, you know, we 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 produce better science because we collaborate. So yep. Useful. Maybe that's what you should say to industry too. I'm not quite sure if they ever allow you to talk about what you do, but yeah, sorry. <laughs> no more questions in the room? Yeah, then thanks a lot for to Jorge, Adele, and uh, Elisa. Thanks for your contribution. Thank uh, you. Yeah, maybe see you then in two years at the next party, hopefully. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, bye bye. Okay.